Hello, and thank you for joining the Pituitary Network Association's webinar program, which is brought to you through the support of our sponsors and our expert contributors. The PNA is dedicated to educating people with pituitary disorders, their families, and their healthcare providers. The PNA is a nonprofit organization that relies on the support from our members and donors. During the webinar, feel free to type in your questions at any time. Please note that all questions will be saved until the end of the webinar. We have allotted enough time to answer as many questions as possible. Today's webinar, Transphenoidal Surgery for Cushing's Disease, is presented by Dr. Manish Agi. Please hold as there will be a brief delay while we change presenters. All right, great. Um, well, thank you, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here um, again for another PNA webinar. Um, I've chosen today to talk about a subject that's near and dear to my heart and um, certainly generates a lot of concerns and angst, understandably, in patient communities because of the toll that the, the disease takes on patients, which is Cushing's disease. Um, and uh, I'm a neurosurgeon at UC San Francisco specializing in pituitary tumors. Um, and so my talk will be broadly about Cushing's disease, but definitely we will emphasize the surgical perspective because there's no doubt that neurosurgeons and um, finding a neurosurgeon you're comfortable with who has sufficient expertise is a big part of the journey patients undergo when they have Cushing's disease. Um, and so that um, will certainly be a point of emphasis. But a number of things I'll be touching on, and so I won't, you know, I'll be going through each of these with some brevity, but um, wanted to cover each of these in as much as possible. So starting with some of the symptoms of, broadly speaking, Cushing's syndrome, which is all of the uh, causes of hypercortisolemia, including Cushing's disease. Uh, talk about some of those causes, then zone in on Cushing's disease for the main, for the remainder of the talk. Talk about how we diagnose Cushing's disease. Spend a lot of time talking about surgery for Cushing's disease, which is a big part of um, the treatment, as I discussed. Uh, and then how we detect post-op remission. And then depending on how much time we have at the end, uh, we'll cover how we deal with failure to achieve remission after surgery, how we manage recurrence after achieving a successful biochemical cure after surgery, and then some of the long-term considerations for the health of patients even after they achieve remission we'll touch on at the end. So starting with the symptoms of Cushing syndrome, um, so as I mentioned, Cushing's syndrome, of, as many of you probably know, is, is really the, a broad category of, dis, of illnesses in which patients have glucocorticoid excess or high levels of cortisol. And, um, and there's a variety of manifestations of this chronic long-term exposure to glucocorticoid excess. Um, statistically speaking, when you look at epidemiologic studies, the most common manifestations of Cushing's disease uh, and Cushing syndrome are hypertension and about 80, over three quarters of the patients, and diabetes mellitus and nearly a quarter of the patients. Um, other things we'll see is psychiatric disturbance or emotional disturbance. Um, the um, the face alt, uh, shape will alter due to body fat deposition changes and create what's known as a moon facies. Osteoporosis or fractures of the bones um, uh, happens in slightly less than 15%. Um, but it's still um, uh, um, you know, certainly among the top five to 10 uh, manifestations we see in the clinic. Uh, enlargement of the heart um, is really more a manifestation of hypertension, so it's not a clinical symptom, but it's something that can be picked up on when you, if you do an echocardiogram on patients with Cushing's disease. Um, and then uh, um, the buffalo hump is sort of the, the, the truncal manifestation of what we see with the moon facies. Obesity has a particular pattern of central fat deposition. Uh, changes in the skin around the abdominal area, the abdominal stria are also described. Thinning of the skin along the arms. Um, and uh, amenorrhea in, uh, in young uh, ovulating women. Uh, muscle weakness due to the effects of steroids on the muscle cells. And, um, and then um, skin ulceration due to impaired wound healing and associated bruising. Um, so that's sort of how these, uh, you know, the classic features of Cushing's syndrome. Um, and I wanted to touch on a moment, sort of, I'm a, not just a neurosurgeon, but a scientist. And so 
I like to think about things mechanistically and and I know many patients in this day and age where we all um, are interested in educating ourselves about our our health um, become interested in and not just knowing that you know that previous screen I showed you with all the cartoon illustrations of the manifestations, but how does cortisol actually cause those those things? And so I've listed six ways here in which cortisol causes different um, uh, systemic illnesses. And I think this helps understand why cortisol is such a damaging hormone in excess. So you think about it, cortisol is a, a stress hormone. It's, you know, the fight or flight response, right? So it has has a very important evolutionary role. Um, when you're being chased in the jungle by a lion, you need your cortisol, all right? So, and, but it does a lot of things that are appropriate in short-term bursts of stress, but not appropriate 24 hours a day, seven days a week in a patient who has um, the illness of Cushing syndrome. So one of them is impaired wound healing. And um, cortisol reduces your levels of interleukin one and eight. It's an anti-inflammatory um, hormone. And that's, certainly helpful when you're you know being chased by a lion that's not the time to worry about wound healing but um uh in in chronic conditions it can lead to skin ulcerations and be really bad similarly you know when you're being chased by a lion you'd rather your blood pressure be a little up i mean it, it's a stress response you don't want to get lightheaded and, and faint you want all of your organs getting the maximum amount of blood possible so transient hypertension is fine but day to day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, it's it's very bad. And the mechanism of that is that cortisol um, is has a, a degree of uh, what we call mineralocorticoid effect on the kidneys and causes sodium retention and volume expansion in the blood. And so um, that's also um, harmful as, as a chronic exposure. Cortisol elevates your blood sugar, and that's fine if the lion's chasing you because your organs need all the sugar they can get, your muscles need all the sugar they can get in order to outrun the lion. Uh, but day to day, uh, cortisol reductions in insulin sensitivity causing high blood sugars. That's well, that's diabetes. That's not good. Diabetes mellitus. Um, cortisol prevents the menstrual cycle. Absolutely appropriate. Um, if a female being chased by a lion, you 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 want to shut down menstruation. That is not the time for that to be occurring. Reproduction is it not shouldn't be occurring at that time in general. And so cortisol reduces hypothalamic GnRH secretion, which reduces FSH and LH secretion, but as a long-term condition, if you have Cushing's, that's associated with infertility, and that's not good also. Uh, cortisol binds to adipocytes and stimulates the fat cells to increase in size. Um, that's fine if you're being chased by a lion, you know, you, you need to, your body will need to burn. It probably isn't gonna even lead to you actually being fat, you're being chased by a lion. It's just storing um, lipid for quick burns um, during that stress response, but day to day that leads to central obesity. And lastly, cortisol enhances bone reabsorption, decreases new bone formation. Again, being chased by a lion is not the time um, to be, you know, growing your femur, um, but you shut down bone reabsorption chronically 24 seven, now your patient's gonna get bone fractures. So that's why, um, that's the mechanism of that. And, and it works because cortisol directly affects the cells in the bone and affects the ability of your gut to absorb calcium. So these are all the things that we don't think of day to day. Maybe physicians don't, aren't, don't have the luxury of time in a 15 to 30 minute appointment, but I, I find it very interesting and I hope you do as well. Um, and then lastly, as I mentioned, cortisol can cause um, psychiatric disturbances. Um, number of patients with Cushing's disease report not quite being right. Some of them are on um, uh, psych psychotherapy and psychological medications. And it's been demonstrated through um, really advanced functional neuroimaging that hypercortisolemia shuts down neuronal networks and cell-to-cell -cell communication between neurons. Um, and mood disturbances are associated with diminished neuronal network activity in the frontal lobes of the brain. Uh, this is an area of ongoing research um, but it's one that I certainly find quite interesting um, and I hope you do as well. So with that, um, we transition from having spoken about the symptoms of Cushing syndrome uh, to the causes of Cushing syndrome. And this is a flow chart that I started using as a, as a trainee and find useful when I have trainees in my clinic and, and operating rooms these days. Um, so patients can have high cortisol for a variety of reasons. Broadly speaking, um, the two categories I think of kind of uh, counterintuitive, but iatrogenic or spontaneous. So iatrogenic is 
you know, the doctor is the, is the culprit. The doctor prescribed you gl glucocorticoids. And so you've got Cushing syndrome because it's pharmacologic. You're, you're on the medication. So for other reasons, maybe you were given steroids for anti-inflammatory role, but obviously you need to stop that in order to prove that you have actual spontaneous non-iatrogenic Cushings. Um, and then spontaneous non-iatrogenic Cushings is a very small percentage of the patients with Cushing syndrome, to be clear. So I have brain tumor patients who get put on um, steroids because of brain edema. And those patients in the, in the chart, it'll say they've developed Cushing syndrome. That's iatrogenic and it's the most common. Spontaneous non-iatrogenic Cushing syndrome is, is, is less common. Um, and when it occurs, it always involves adrenal oversecretion of cortisol because it's defined as hypercortisolemia. So it has to come the cortisol comes from the adrenal gland. It's not being made by the pituitary, it's being made by the adrenal gland. And so then having now described that category, we can say that adrenal hypercortisolemia can be one of two etiologies. One is ACTH dependent, meaning your cortisol is high because your ACTH is high, ACTH drives cortisol. And then the second category is ACTH independent. The cortisol is just cranking away from the adrenal glands um, despite um, a lack of high ACTH in those patients. So if we think about ACTH dependent, the ACTH is high, it's either coming from the pituitary or not in the pituitary. If it's not in the pituitary, it's considered ectopic ACTH. Some place like a lung tumor is making the ACTH that doesn't normally make ACTH. If it's from the pituitary, it's pituitary ACTH over secretion. The vast majority of these are Cushing's disease, which is caused by an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma, but a rare subset can be CRH secreting hypothalamic tumors that drive the pituitary, but those are incredibly rare. Um, and then um, ACTH independent Cushing's syndrome comes always from the adrenal gland. Generally, it's a unilateral adrenocortical tumor, which can be carcinoma or a bit more benign adenoma. Um, and uh, occasionally it can be bilateral from both adrenal glands, but that's pretty rare. So basically the way I think of it is two thirds of these cases are from the pituitary about a third of them are from the adrenal glands. Um, so now having broken down these categories, we talk a little bit about Cushing's disease, generally arises from an ACTH secreting pituitary adenoma. Usually it doesn't take a very large tumor to cause Cushing's disease in the pituitary gland. Average size in most of the series, including ours at UCSF, is about six millimeters. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know, I'll touch on in my surgical talk why that makes them challenging about a three to one female to male ratio. Um, ACTH over secretion, it triggers uh, not just excess production of cortisol, but excess production of adrenal androgens and other steroids uh, that can be detected in the bloodstream. But the primary one that causes the symptomatology is the excess cortisol. Interestingly, Harvey Cushing, one of the godfathers of neurosurgery, when he originally, the disease is named after him and in his original series, which is now coming up on nearly a century old, uh, patients who presented would die within less than five years. Um, since the advent of transphenoidal surgery, um, as well as advances in radio surgery and medication, which I'll touch on a little bit, 99% um, of patients survive five years once diagnosed with Cushing's disease. Um, and uh, the vast majority, well over 80%, survive for two decades after being diagnosed and referred to a provider. But Cushing series is very illustrative because it tells you that Certainly, um, failure to achieve remission, um, whether it be remission through surgery, radiation, or medications, will dramatically shorten the patient's lifespan. So while this is not regarded as a malignant tumor, I mean, there's really not that many malignant, the, the, the definition of a tumor uh, altering your lifespan to less than five years if untreated, I would argue that hormonally, you know, it behaves with a, a level of malignancy based on its systemic effects on the body. And that's why this is such a bad disease. So now that we've distinguished Cushing's disease from Cushing's syndrome, how do we diagnose Cushing's disease? How do we know that a patient has Cushing's disease? So the Endocrine Society, and I like to frame these in terms of guidelines and societies so that it's not just my opinion, but a consensus opinion, requires that we use at least two of three tests. And the idea here is that you don't want to get it wrong. And so the three established tests, um, the first two are the ones that are most common. The third one is less common. 24-hour uh, urinary free cortisol over 50 micrograms per day. Second one is a midnight plasma cortisol. So the idea here is 
at midnight, your um, cortisol should be low. At 6 a.m., it's high in all of us. So morning cortisol may not distinguish um, Cushing's disease from a, or Cushing's syndrome from a patient um, uh, who just wakes up with high cortisol. But at midnight, it should be low. But it's really hard to get to the lab and draw your blood at midnight. So you can actually, um, that's an inpatient procedure because in the middle of the night, no outpatient lab is open. But you can give a patient tubes to check late night salivary cortisol as close to midnight as possible. And normally it should be suppressed, but not in Cushing's patients. This is, uh, to be clear, how you diagnose Cushing's syndrome, just confirming that they have hypercortisolemia above normal. And the third one, the one that's used less commonly because of its um, complex, slightly more complex nature and um, is uh, the low-dose dexamethasone suppression test. Give a patient a low dose of dexamethasone, either a milligram the night before or half a milligram um, every six hours for 48 hours, and then measure their cortisol either in the blood in the case of the overnight test or um, in 24-hour containers for the standard three-day assay. And if the cortisol doesn't drop after low-dose dexamethasone, you've confirmed Cushing syndrome. Um, and so this is the standard. Now, mind you, many times in practice, if there's high clinical suspicion and if test one or two sort of hits it out of the park, I've seen providers refer without a confirmatory test. But I will say that the vast majority of patients who go to surgery will at a minimum have one of the first two tests done more than once on separate occasions to confirm the diagnosis before proceeding with surgery, particularly in the setting of a, of a questionable MRI um, where there's some uncertainty as to whether there's a radiographically uh, detectable tumor. Um, and then the rarely used test, which I'll just gloss over, is the dexamethasone CRH test. Um, I'm not even going to cover this, but it's just rarely used um, more in sort of academic circles. Um, so now that we've confirmed that the patient has Cushing's um, syndrome, how do we know that they have Cushing's disease? How do we know it's coming from the pituitary? And so the high-dose dexamethasone test, as opposed to the low-dose test, is valuable. A high dose of dexamethasone will suppress cortisol in a patient with a pituitary tumor. It will not suppress ectopic ACTH or adrenal tumors. Um, the CRH stimulation test is also useful. CRH can drive pituitary ACTH production in patients with um, Cushing's disease, but it cannot in patients with ectopic ACTH release because the pituitary will be suppressed in those patients. But many times, confirmation of a central source or determining that the patient has Cushing's disease can be based on biochemical evaluation and then radiographically assessing um, the pituitary gland. And that's done through MRIs as well as inferior petrosal sinus sampling. So MRIs, if the lab suggests Cushing's disease, the next step is to get an MRI to find a pituitary tumor. And as I mentioned, the challenge here is that um, these are very small tumors and they can be tough to detect. Um, and so this is a real challenge. Historically, years ago, most MRIs were one and a half T or one and a half Tesla. That's the magnet strength. Um, but that's proven to be um, inferior for detecting um, tumors. So now at academic centers, we have routine access to three Tesla MRIs. And here you see an example of the one and a half Tesla MRI on a patient with Cushing's. You know, is there something on the right that's dark? Maybe here's something on the left that's also dark. You go to three Tesla and now you see it clear as day, profound hypodensity or darkness in the left side of the gland. And you've got definitive evidence of a microadenoma lateralizing to the left in that patient. Um, even better is getting to seven Tesla. These are not routinely available. We have a research scanner at, at UCSF that we do have access to for complex cases. Um, but some of the studies have suggested that 90% um, of patients where you suspect Cushing's disease um, with a negative three Tesla MRI will have positive seven Tesla MRIs. Interestingly, um, pituitary microadenomas are so common, as many as one in six of us will have one, which has really been a slogan of the, P P uh, of the PNA for, uh, for so long, that, um, uh, that we have to be careful with super high resolution imaging. Um, because you may detect a non-functional adenoma. And so the more you jack up the sensitivity on the MRI, the more likely you are to pick up a non-corticotropic adenoma. And so about 20% of patients who end up having an adenoma on a 7T MRI will actually have either no tumor or a non-corticotropic adenoma. Um, so it's a valuable tool, but it's so sensitive that you, it may reveal something 
that's a false positive. Um, at UCSF, um, a lot of times, rather than jacking up the Tesla, whether it's a, you know, and then going to seven Tesla, we'll take a patient with a negative three Tesla MRI and switch to dynamic imaging, in which the images are acquired at multiple time points after contrast administration, just focusing purely on the pituitary. This is like multiple snapshots of the same location at multiple time points after gadolinium administration. And we found that it detects adenomas in about 96% of patients with a suspicion for Cushing's disease, 16% false positive rate. So you're getting pretty similar results to seven Tesla. Um, and uh, um, and this is a, a, a test that's more routinely available. Uh, these days, per, certainly at community scanners, more and more are getting comfortable with dynamic protocols, but 7T is an infrastructure issue and you're just not gonna find that in every center, in every imaging center. Um, you know, in, very smart radiologists have learned to make do with, in, in, with three Tesla MRIs and have said, Look, it's not just the post gadolinium sequences, we can look at other sequences. And so if you look at flare sequences, delayed microadenoma contrast washout has revealed brightness in otherwise MRI and negative Cushing's cases. And so we routinely will give contrast after flare sequences to complement the post contrast T1 sequence for surgical cases. And this has a positive predictive value also of 90%. So working closely with our radiology colleagues, we've really maximized the power, the sensitivity of MRI to detect tumors in these patients, which is incredibly important because these tumors and Cushing's disease patients are so small. We can also take advantage of imaging outside of MRI, and that's where PET imaging will sometimes come in handy. Um, routinely, PET imaging uh, is done by giving a patient a labeled tracer, fluorodeoxyglucose, and it goes wherever glucose is uptake. It's essentially a metabolic tracer. And the premise is that cancer is a highly metabolic, tumors are highly metabolic and will take up the tracer. The problem is you can't do uh, FDG or fluorodeoxyglucose PET imaging in the brain because there's high background. The brain takes up the tracer at very high levels. And that includes around the pituitary. So you get high artificial background. But you can use other tracers. And two that have been uh, studied in the pituitary, 11C methionine taken up by the pituitary not by the brain, brain, has enhanced uptake by most adenoma types. And DOTA uh, TOC is a somatostatin receptor agonist that is used to localize somatostatin receptor positive tumors. Um, as many of you may know, Cushing's uh, corticotrophic adenomas do have somatostatin receptor expression. And so they can be detected by this imaging modality. And I've shown here a patient that I operated on who had positive signal in the right inferior cella with Cushing's disease could not localize with a dynamic three Tesla MRI, but could localize uh, with, with PET tracer. Again, a case sam with a sample size of one, but just goes to show you the power of thinking about every possible tool in your tool belt before you take patients to surgery um, in order to maximize your confidence that you're going to achieve surgical biochemical remission. If imaging fails to show a pituitary adenoma, we can all do always do petrosal sinus sampling. This is a time-honored tool. We don't use it that often at UCSF as we used to, and I'll touch on some of the reasons why in a moment, but in terms of the methodology, you're catheterizing through the groin catheterization and passing catheters into the right and left petrosal sinus on both sides of the pituitary gland. This is typically done after giving the patient systemic CRH stimulation, and now you're gonna measure ACTH in both sides, the left and the right, compare it to the ACTH in a forearm vein and get the ratios a higher ACTH in the sinus than the forearm is indicative of an adenoma. The test will lose reliability in patients who've had prior pituitary surgery because the venous drainage will change laterality after that surgery. Um, and then uh, how do we interpret IPSS? Well, really the money is all in the interpretation uh, and that's where the, the, the experience of the technicians comes in handy. Generally, if the pituitary to peripheral ratio is above two, two or above three, if it was a CRH stimulated study, we would be feel that the patient has a central source, as we call it, or basically pituitary ACTH secretion or Cushing's disease. And that's pretty much 100% reliable. But once the ratio gets um, lower than you know that, um, less than 1.5 or less than three, if the CRH was given, then you become more concerned about an ectopic source um, lateralization is far less reliable and more controversial. I think it, most people agree that an IPSS is good for confirming a central source, um, but if you're concerned about 
is it coming from the left or right gland, which can influence um, the neurosurgeon's exploration of the gland. Some people would argue that a right to left ratio above 1.4 or the converse of that below 0.7 will tell you if it's a right or left sided adenoma. But this is a source of tremendous controversy. And I personally have taken several patients to the OR and found tumors opposite where the IPSS would suggest. But I've never found centralization to be wrong uh, with IPSS. So it is useful if you have doubts about centralization or perhaps a negative MRI. Um, but in terms of lateralization, it's less, re less, less reliable. Um, so the mainstay of this talk will be surgery for Cushing's disease. Um, and I think no talk about surgery for Cushing's disease would be complete without mentioning the importance of the pseudocapsule. The histological pseudocapsule of the pituitary adenoma is a layer of compressed normal gland that surrounds the adenoma and can be used during surgery to identify and guide complete removal of the tumor. We call this extracapsular removal of a pituitary microadenoma. It also can be done in macroadenomas. It's a technique that was first described by Ed Oldfield, one of the pioneers of Cushing's disease, um, who we remember fondly in the field. And basically, when you do this in the operating room, you're, you're using sharp dissection uh, to reveal the yellow microadenoma, and you're peeling away the dura and sometimes a thin rim of uh, normal gland. But when you get to the pseudocapsule, the way you know you're there is that your dissecting tool will readily um, pass around the pseudocapsule. And sometimes that compressed gland at the border of the pseudocapsule will, will soften as you're, as you're working. And so when that happens, I typically will pause and shift to another side. But the goal is to deliver this tumor in its whole. Keep in mind what's coming out here is about an eight millimeter tumor under very high magnification. Um, as a big globus uh, lesion, and, and it's delivered in its entirety. Afterwards, there's um, fluid, but, but no solid tumor. This is really the best way of achieving a gross total resection. If you achieve pseudocapsular resection, this is a piece, piece of fat plugging up the hole after the tumor is taken out. And if you do pseudocapsular dissection, you will have complete, you know, uh, your confidence of biochemical remission is, is very high. In, in a patient like that. And that's really the goal when we take patients to surgery, particularly those with Cushing's disease. Sometimes um, tumors can invade the cavernous sinus. Um, it's not too common with Cushing's disease, but it certainly can happen. Um, and you know, while we don't go chasing after a non-functional tumor that's invading the cavernous sinus because we have treatment options such as radiosurgery, given the importance of, you know, and the understanding that surgery um, can, can really play a role in rapid biochemical remission from a very terrible illness with, such as Cushing's disease. Um, the technologies have improved with endoscopic pituitary surgery to allow us to sometimes achieve biochemical remission for tumors that truly are invading the cavernous sinus. Here you see an example of a 55-year-old female with biochemical Cushing's disease, and her tumor uh, encased the right cavernous carotid artery, shown here by the darkness along the right cavernous carotid. And um, when taken to surgery, um, uh, we went ahead and removed, uh, opened the dura over the pituitary gland after drilling out the cellar bone. Um, and um, And once uh, we were into the, uh, into the gland, we identified pale tumor abutting the right side of the pituitary gland. In this case, an extra capsular dissection is, is tricky because yeah, part of it is up against carotid artery. So we can't do a complete extra capsular dissection, but we do protect the normal gland and develop a very sharp plane between the tumor and the gland and deliver that part of the tumor. And then we get into the cavernous sinus. We make a separate dural cut into the cavernous sinus. You get this bright red or uh, red venous bleeding from the cavernous sinus now, but once you are patient and get through that, you're in the cavernous sinus and you're seeing the pulsatile right carotid artery, you're getting venous bleeding, but you're patiently waiting till that happens. And you're uh, following that pale tumor that was previously resected from the cellar side and getting it out all around the carotid artery. Um, it abutted the carotid artery. It, it was not adherent to the carotid artery. And so although there is a, some associated venous bleeding with this, with a little patience, it can be done safely. And eventually, once 
you're able to get that soft tumor out. You have more clear visualization of the patient's um, right carotid artery um, after uh, a successful removal. And in this case, this led to um, biochemical remission on uh, postoperative day one uh, that was durable in nature. And so this is an example of how uh, the technology has really improved to allow complete resection uh, in these tumors, um, uh, even when they are um, invading the cavernous sinus in some cases. But this, of course, is, is really best done at centers with experience and expertise in order to do it safely. And here you see that carotid artery uh, that we were talking about. So what about the, you know, we, so now we've explained that you can sometimes take out a tumor that's truly invading the cavernous sinus, but there's a more subtle modification of this that's been developed recently, which is this idea of medial cavernous sinus wall resection. Uh, it's become increasingly more common. So you can, you know, take out a tumor, expose the medial cavernous sinus wall, elevate it off the carotid artery, and sharply excise that and send it to pathology. And in some cases, it'll reveal tumor cells that were in the medial cavernous sinus wall. This is a procedure, though, that's not without some morbidity. There is about a, depending on the institutional series, about a five to eight percent risk of cranial nerve neuropathies with this. And so this is something you would really only want to do if you felt like it was adding a chance, a real meaningful chance, greater than five to eight percent, because that's the harm risk of uh, achieving biochemical remission in a Cushing's disease patient. So our practice at UCSF is that even if the tumor abuts the medial cavernous sinus wall, if you're able to get a true medial uh, extra pseudocapsular dissection, and if you discover that you know, it was really that pseudocapsule that was abutting the medial cavernous sinus wall, um, then we don't resect the medial cavernous sinus wall, and those patients in our experience are still likely to achieve biochemical remission. But we have had a, some cases where the pseudocapsule does not have a good plane of separation between the medial cavernous sinus dura. And in those cases, rather than force a plane and stop the operation, we resect, expose the medial cavernous sinus wall, and then resect the medial cavernous sinus dura, and that increases your probability of biochemical remission. So the idea is that just because we have a tool, um, there is some risk with the tool, and we have to use the tool judiciously and cautiously in cases where we think it can help the patient. And so this, combined with the endoscope in general, has really empowered uh, the surgery to achieve um, uh, meaningful and impactful results. Um, what about if the MRI is negative? What are some surgical tools that we can use in the OR to find tumors? Intraoperative ultrasound can be very valuable. Um, tumors will, once you put an ultrasound probe up against them, will sonicate differently than normal gland. And that can have about a 70 to 80% accuracy rate in detecting adenomas if you just put it against the gland in the operating rooms. I've done that on some cases. Um, there's some exploratory studies out of University of Pennsylvania using um, near infrared dyes to detect. So these are administered systemically to the patient before the operation. And then you put a fluorescent filter on your endoscope. And in some cases, that can help you visualize a tumor that wasn't seen on an MRI. But ultimately, at the end of the day, if you have a negative MRI, we, we will routinely perform what's called transphenoidal exploration, making small paramedia and superior inferior cuts in the gland all the way from right to left, and determining if we're able to release a small tumor, have achieved biochemical remission in some cases like that, sometimes by actually getting a specimen to pathology that shows a tumor. In some cases, the specimen we get is negative, but the patient goes into remission, presumably because a very small tumor may have been aspirated um, unknowingly during the surgery. And so there is a value to going to the operating room with, if you have a negative MRI and you've exhausted all possible op options, if the biochemical testing confirms a central source. And this scenario happens in about less than 10% of overall cases. With modern imaging, we're able to find the tumor in 90% of cases, but still in the current year of 2022, about 10% of patients fall into these categories. And these are some of the tools we have to help them. Uh, as a surgeon, it's very important for me to know and, and teach my trainees at San Francisco that caring for a Cushing's disease patient is not just about the surgery. Um, it, it's about caring for them in the operating room. Um, I have have been a family member of patients going to surgery, and I think knowing that your surgeon is there from start to finish 
is there when the patient's wheeled in, is there when the patient's wheeled out, is very important, particularly important for Cushing's disease because your anesthesiologist, if they haven't worked with Cushing's disease patients before, needs to know that these patients should not receive preoperative steroids because they're hypercortisolemic. Um, and we don't typically give postoperative steroids right away until the next morning. Um, we check a, a AM cortisol and then um, uh, start them on um, uh, steroid replacement um, because if they're in remission, they will need steroid replacement. If they come into the operation on ketoconazole, then we will sometimes give stress dose steroids because they may be biochemically normal on ketoconazole. Um, patients with Cushing's disease have other manifestations, as I mentioned at the beginning of the talk. They may have sleep apnea, so we have to be careful with um, having them not use CPAP after transphenoidal surgery. They may have hypertension or hyperglycemia and may need intravenous drips to control blood sugars or blood pressure after surgery. Um, patients may have pathologic fractures that they're unaware of, so we have to be very careful when we're positioning them during surgery, make sure their extremities and their back is adequately padded. Um, they may have, uh, uh, and, and they may need intravenous drips, as I mentioned, during the operation. Um, how do we detect postoperative remission? There's a variety of studies that have looked at this. I've summarized um, over two decades worth on this slide. And um, basically, what you find is that, interestingly, the more stringent your criteria are for remission, the lower your recurrence rate is. So it's quite possible that if you loosen the definition of remission, and let more patients into the remission club, that those patients may just end up recurring earlier. Um, but in general, clinical remission of symptoms is really all or none. And the biochemical criteria for remission vary considerably. Some people require undetectable postoperative serum cortisol. Some people say subnormal, just below normal. Some people will look at low dose dexamethasone suppression. Um, and some people will check a 24 hour urinary free cortisol. I check the postoperative serum cortisol, and you know I'm considering subnormal to be a, a great start on the morning of the postoperative day one. And then in the clinic, we get a 24-hour urinary free up cortisol at the follow-up appointment a few weeks later, and that's um, usually very reliable. Um, but these are some of the remission and recurrence rates that have been posted in the literature. And you can see that if you really want undetectable serum cortisol, you're only going to get you know 70% of the patients that meet that criteria for remission. Uh, but only 3% of those will recur. So that's the most stringent definition. It suggests that there may be a component of patients who might have a cell or two hanging out, but meet a less strict criteria for remission and may be prone to more long-term recurrences later. This is an area of some ongoing debate or controversy. Overall, uh, most of the meta-analyses in the literature have supported the idea that surgery for all comers at, at dozens of institutional series um, is associated with an 80% biochemical remission rate. So if you take a patient with Cushing's disease, regardless of, of the nature of the MRI, the tumor size, you have about an 80% chance of cure. And then you can fine tune that when discussing it with the patient preoperatively based on the size of the tumor or whether they had a tumor on the MRI to start with. Um, and uh, what are some factors that increase your likelihood of surgical success? Um, really a, a visible, uh, a tumor that's too big, a macroadenoma, or a tumor that's undetectable makes it harder to achieve remission. Invading the cavernous sinus, as I mentioned, we're getting better at it, but it's still not as good as if the tumor didn't invade the cavernous sinus. And in your favor would be increased surgeon experience, microadenomas, and an immediate postoperative uh, cortisol that's undetectable or subnormal. Um, and this is just the bar graphs that tell you the same thing, that the odds of remission are higher with microadenomas compared to macroadenomas, primary surgery compared to revision surgery. Best chance of getting it right is, is the first time. I'm seeing a patient um, tomorrow morning actually with um, uh, a failed first surgery at another center. And you know, unfortunately we have to counsel them that um, we have tremendous expertise, but the data would suggest that revision surgery is associated with a lower probability of remission. Uh, and that's likely because they may have gotten into the tumor and spread some cells. And so we've lost, we may have lost the ability to do pseudocapsular dissection in those cases. Um, there's a concept of delayed remission. So patients who don't normalize uh, immediately after surgery, but do normalize within a few weeks of surgery. And some people feel like this is real um, and that it's due to adrenal hyperplasia 
um, from prolonged cortisol and, and that the adrenals may take a while to calm down. Second possibility would be there may be some residual cells after the surgery that just die. Um, I, I think in general, this is an area of some controversy because the recurrence rate in delayed remission cases is higher than immediate remission cases. So kind of the, the general theme here is if you, if you use a looser criteria and delayed remission is a looser criteria, then, um, uh, then you may also get higher recurrence and have to watch those patients carefully. But at the same time, remission is remission. You certainly don't need to be on ketoconazole or undergoing gamma knife radio surgery if you're in remission, regardless of whether it was early or delayed, but you may need to be followed more closely if you achieve delayed remission. Uh, one of the other things I found is that um, somebody who has one very strict criteria combined with one very loose criteria may actually have durable remission. So I had a patient, I've had a patient once who achieved delayed undetectable cortisol. So the delayed part was was subnormal or suboptimal, but the undetectable cortisol was better than subnormal. And so that patient achieved a decade of remission despite being delayed remission because it was really good remission, which is undetectable postoperative cortisol, even though it was delayed. So this is an area of some complexity, um, but uh, this is where having a center with expertise to help guide you, not just preoperatively, but postoperatively can be very helpful. So when we see patients from, you know, coming from great distances for surgery, we will um, follow them very closely postoperatively, even if they make the journey back home, review their labs, get to know the center where they're checking their labs, and uh, and really um, uh, offer guidance to help their local doctors uh, and support the efforts of their local doctors as well. Uh, if there's no remission after surgery, um, there's a number of options. If there were an adenoma on MRI, you know you could consider waiting for delayed remission, but at some point, um, uh, you know, repeat surgery is advisable in those cases, particularly if you knew where the tumor was to start with. If the MRI was negative, but the IPSS lateralized and the first surgery was negative, you can consider going back to the operating room for hemi-hypophysectomy. There's some variability as to how to do this. Um, one approach that I've seen described in the literature is to do the two-thirds gland resection, where you're taking out um, everything except the central portion of the gland and the side where the tumor lateralized to. Um, uh, and, um, and that's an approach that can have an acceptable rate of new hormonal deficits while still providing the hormonal, the biochemical benefit of hemi Um, And, you know, I think patients that fail to achieve uh, remission after surgery and undergo reoperation uh, actually have about a 60 to 80% chance of remission. Uh, so repeat surgery is, is certainly advisable for patients who feel to achieve remission after initial surgery. Um, I think e even in cases with normal MRIs, there have been remission uh, examples. And this is a study I did when I was in Boston before coming to San Francisco. But we've been able to demonstrate similar success for the rare cases that need repeat surgery in San Francisco. Uh, and here you see the bar graph from the meta-analysis showing that repeat surgery has a 60% remission rate. Um, after a failure initially. So you go from 80% to 60% based on the meta-analyses, still better than 50% chance of remission with revision surgery, and which is better than your chances with medication or radiation, which is why we would advise it. Um, and the, the impact of indication on remission rates after revision surgery, the one variable that's important to note is, did the tumor recur versus was it never taken out properly in the first place? If it's a true recurrence, the remission rates are actually closer to 80%. Similar, you know, but if it's a persistence after the first surgery, it gets a little lower, around 54%. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, but if you're successful with surgery, it's also important um, uh, to be able to manage these patients hormonally. And that's more the job of the endocrinologist, but as surgeons, it's very important. Patients in remission will often be hypoadrenal for their first year. Uh, this can cause adrenal crisis. These patients will you know, need to uh, be told to take their, their uh, dexamethasone or hydrocortisone very strictly. I've indicated here some options for physiologic steroid dosing that recapitulate normal cortisol uh, production. Uh, it's very important. I learned this the hard way early in practice. I had a patient who achieved biochemical remission and came to the six-week postoperative visit and um, mistakenly received uh, paperwork for non-Cushing's patients who are told to hold uh, steroids for biochemical testing to document normal function after surgery. 
unlike Cushing's disease patients where we don't have the mold steroids because six weeks is too early, they're gonna be hypoadrenal for six to 12 months. And that patient arrived in the clinic appointment, very lightheaded um, because he was in hypoadrenal crisis. Um, luckily he did fine, we got him um, uh, fluid resuscitation, um, but uh, in the emergency room and uh, got him back on his steroids. Um, and this is just, um, uh, illustrates how important it is to be on steroids. Now they can be held at six months for testing and they may be hypoadrenal, but at least at that point it'll be safe and they won't, they're generally not gonna be hypoadrenal enough to get in crisis, but at six weeks it can definitely happen. Um, no data supports the practice of one glucocorticoid over another for steroid replacement. Um, as I mentioned, I've seen all kinds used. Um, our endocrinologists will routinely use hydrocortisone in these cases. Um, and, um, and these patients also need to be told to adjust their dosing if they develop fevers um, or a need for stress dosing. This was particularly important during the pandemic recently um, as patients were um, uh, dealing with the potential risk of infection in the community um, and the need to um, guard against this with uh, excess glucocorticoid replacement in our postoperative Cushing's population. Um, so I, I'm down to, I, I want to make sure we leave time for questions, um, and I think um, I'm just going to quickly gloss over a few things, and um, but we'll leave time for questions. Um, I went at a slightly slower pace, so some of this content I'm happy to discuss um, uh, offline via email, but you know, really quickly, how do we um, manage when remission fails to occur after multiple surgeries? One of the tools that can be helpful is if you were able to get a sample of the gland during the unsuccessful surgery, we have our pathologist look for Crook's hyaline change. Um, and if the pituitary gland was really exposed to glucocorticoid excess, the corticotrophs um, will undergo a, a histologic change. And that just tells you, you know, did we have the right diagnosis? Um, I mean, if there was no adenoma and the IPSS was ambiguous and there was no Crook's hyaline change, Maybe the biochemical testing was just a false positive in, in some of those cases. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, failure to achieve remission can be managed medically by a variety of drugs. Ketoconazole is a time-honored favorite. These are some of the mechanisms of the drug, um, but we, we do commonly see patients um, with complex Cushing's disease who fail to achieve surgical remission managed by ketoconazole, which blocks multiple enzymes in the pathway for cortisol production, as you see here. Um, it's successful in normalizing uh, cortisol in 45% of patients after three months. That's why it's not frontline therapy because even repeat surgery is successful 60% of the time. So repeat surgery is ahead of ketoconazole in the workflow for these patients. Also has side effects of liver toxicity in about 12% of patients. Um, other categories of drugs for Cushing's disease less commonly used. Mifeprestone was studied in a clinical trial with some encouraging results in patients with high blood sugars. Um, and led to FDA approval in those particular patients uh, with severe diabetes associated with Cushing's disease. Um, and uh, the other category is uh, um, the somatostatin analogs, um, which were also approved in a phase three clinical trial, um, although the FDA acknowledged surgery was still the primary treatment for those patients. Um, and so I, I think, you know, the other thing, of course, in extreme cases, um, you can remove the entire pituitary. This is thankfully very rarely done uh, in the modern era. Or you can do bilateral adrenalectomy. This has moved ahead of hypophysectomy because it's more, it's less morbid, um, particularly with laparoscopic bilateral adrenalectomy. But in San Francisco, this is a procedure that we're seeing less than once a year for very severe Cushing's disease cases, um, and should not be, um, should be far down the algorithm. And, and management strategies. Um, managing recurrence, um, uh, you know, we've had a number of cases of recurrence that have been managed, um, and, and it is about 10 to 20% in the long run. Institutional series will suggest that surgery for recurrence is still frontline therapy because it is effective in about 70 to 90% of re uh, recurrences, um, very similar to the success rate of first time surgeries. Uh, remission can be a little slower after repeat surgery. Um, but it is still effective. Um, uh, but here you see the difference between first surgery and second surgery is, is about a 30% uh, drop in remission rates. Um, radio surgery can be used for patients that fail to achieve remission or recur. Um, and ACTH producing adenomas are thankfully fairly sensitive to radiation. 
uh, but you need a good target. And so if it's a negative MRI, this is certainly not advisable. Some have suggested proton beam radiosurgery, but this is you know, not readily available. And I don't think that that necessarily has been proven out by um, uh, many series. Um, it's very important if you undergo radiosurgery for Cushing's disease to hold suppressive medications um, that can rev up the proliferation rate of the tumor and make it a better radiosurgical target. Um, radiation does have a risk of hypopituitarism, um, but it's nowhere near the risk of, um, of removing the gland. So this is still a therapy that can be considered ahead of hypophysectomy in many patients. And lastly, you know, even patients who undergo remission after Cushing's disease need to have general health monitoring after successful surgery. There's some evidence to suggest that their medical complication risk uh, does not fully normalize after remission. This is an area of some controversy, um, and that their life expectancy may not be fully normal after Cushing's disease is cured. I mean, you can see that it's very good at hovering over 80% beyond 15 years, way better than what it was in Cushing's original series, where you know the vast majority of these patients had passed away at five years. Um, but there may be some lingering effects from periods of transient hypercortisolemia. There's also some evidence to suggest that the duration of hypercortisolemia plays a role in these lingering effects, underscoring how important it is to get patients in uh, to see specialists in a timely fashion and to diagnose Cushing's disease as quickly as possible. Um, so with that, I wanna thank you for your time. I hope I've shown you that Cushing's disease comes from ACTH secreting pituitary adenomas. It's important to achieve remission in a timely manner. And remission can be achieved through surgery, um, but for refractory cases, we have radiation and medical options. Adrenalectomy can be used um, for even more severe cases with, with appropriate patient selection. So with that, I thank you for your time. Um, open it up to some questions, and I know sometimes we'll, we'll do questions uh, via the message board or chat board, and remaining questions can certainly be done um, uh, online or offline uh, after the uh, chat as well. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Agi, for such a great presentation. Another great presentation. They're always really, really valuable and great. Um, we do have a couple questions. The first one, and um, we only have time for a couple questions. The first one is, what role does a high CHI-67 at 15% and mitotic count play in confirmed Cushing's adenoma? That is a great question, um, and it's an area of ongoing research in, in my lab and others, but there is some evidence um, to suggest that um, corticotrophic adenomas are more aggressive biologically and more prone to examples like the questioner just asked of high proliferation index. Um, and, uh, and, you know, we've been able to show this at a molecular level. Uh, a patient with a 15% proliferation index um, on their pathologic specimen. If they were in remission, we wouldn't do anything more, but we would be very concerned and need to monitor them very closely. And that is a patient who should not be lost to follow up. Um, and that means very close surveillance in the postoperative period to monitor for recurrence. Um, there's examples of corticotrophic adenomas that become carcinoma, which is no longer a diagnosis, but used to be where it spreads outside the gland. And those are cases have been associated with high proliferation rate. So in, in a 15% KI-67, not, we're only not just worried about recurrence, but we're worried about it becoming a more aggressive tumor biologically and, and potentially spreading outside the gland. So we need to be very careful with those patients. Okay, thank you. And then we have one more question which I believe you touched on a little bit, um, but I'll go ahead and read it to you anyways. It is, if you have two surgeries and experience recurrence after a brief one to two year period of remission, would a repeat surgery be recommended? And how many times can surgery be done to remove a tumor from the cella? It's a good question. I mean, we've had patients undergo four to five surgeries. There is some slight increase in morbidity. Um, with subsequent surgeries, um, but you know Cushing's disease is is a is a case where we do try to um, uh, push it um, uh, because it's surgery is the best tool, as I mentioned. So certainly, you know, obviously it varies from case to case, but with proven biochemical recurrence, if there's a positive MRI, third surgeries are not unheard of. 
Okay, thank you so much. Um, once again, as Dr. Augie has said, if you have any more questions, you can go ahead and email directly to Dr. Augie or us at um, pituitary.org and we will reach out to him and help coordinate that conversation. But tonight that um, concludes our webinar. So thank you again, Dr. Augie. That was a great presentation. Uh, we appreciate you taking the time to join us. If you missed any part of this webinar or if you would like to share it with family members or friends, it will be available on our website at www.pituitary.org after it is edited. There will be a brief survey after the webinar. Please fill it out to help us provide you with the information you need. And thank you again for joining us. Have a great night. And we will see you again soon. Thank you. Thank you.